uh, Josh Meyer at Politico. He's uh, he's really done a great job this past year, uh, just exposing the truth uh, behind the Iran nuke deal that uh, the Obama administration uh, finalized. If you remember, on January the sixteenth, uh, two thousand and sixteen. So we'll uh, we'll come to that uh, that story here in just a bit. Uh, and again, I'll just refer you to what we've written. Over the years, our King of the South booklet in particular, but of course with respect to Iran and the Obama administration and the nuke deal, uh, we've had uh, various articles at thetrumpet.com over the years as well. Another booklet, um, a more recent one, The Prophesied Prince of uh, Russia. Speaking of uh, Richard, we're going to, at the end of the show, we're going to be playing um, a message that he gave on uh, that particular booklet. So as I was saying to Richard earlier, he's just pretty much hijacking <laughs> the uh, the program uh, today. Well, we, we brought him in here because he's tried to... Uh, do we even know how many words that uh, piece was? It was a pretty lengthy uh, document. Yeah, 35 pages. I'm not sure... Uh... Not sure on the word count. Okay. Well, in any event, it uh, it's the secret backstory of how Obama let Hezbollah off the hook. And as I said, Josh Meyer, he he's been exposing this uh, over the last many months, and the the story is just more and more involved, and more and more details that are coming forward. Um, like as you just heard there in this most recent case, just uh, must have been uh, ten thousand words. Fourteen thousand. There we go. Just for the count. Fourteen thousand. So there you go. Just to give you a little bit of background, uh, as I think most of our listeners know, President Obama signed the deal. Uh, what a little over, uh, I guess, almost two years ago now. And uh, as we uh, said at the time, I mean, this was effectively crowning Iran as the the king of the south and uh, of course in the case of uh, Barack Obama he he uh he was elected as a US president in late 2008 and um I forget who did the reporting on this whether it was Josh Meyer or someone else but uh um but some have reported on his uh, secret back channel deals that he uh that he promised the Ayatollah the supreme leader that um that look we're going to be a friend to you talk about collusion coming into office, uh, promises were made, and then of course, uh, who can forget some of the things that uh, President Obama said in those early months of his presidency when he was basically saying, you know, all of that animosity, all of the killing, all of the terrorism uh, sponsored by Iran uh, since the Islamic Revolution in, in 1979, all of that was basically in the past. We're here to uh, to start a new friendship. This is uh, one snippet from his, uh, his Cairo speech in June of 2009, clip one. Since the Islamic Revolution, Iran has played a role in acts of hostage taking and violence against U.S. troops and civilians. This history is well known. Rather than remain trapped in the past, I've made it clear to Iran's leaders and people that my country is prepared to move forward. The question now is not what Iran is against, but rather what future it wants to build. I recognize it will be hard to overcome decades of mistrust, but we will proceed with courage, rectitude, and resolve. There will be many issues to discuss between our two countries, and we are willing to move forward without preconditions on the basis of mutual respect. And so move forward, uh, he did. Uh, right around the time of that uh, speech, um, the uh, the Green Movement in Iran, if you remember, rose up in defiance against the uh, Supreme Leader, and uh, and the uh, uh, the mullahs crushed that resistance. It was a democratic uprising, and of course, the United States was there. Uh, actually, was not there. <laughs> the United States just turned a blind eye to what was happening in uh, in uh, in Iran. And from that point forward, basically every foreign policy decision that uh, President Obama made helped. It helped to strengthen and embolden the uh, the king of the south, the prophesied king of the south, resulting in as uh, as I say that uh, that nuclear deal on January the 16th, 
2016, and it's something that uh, President Obama said, um, unbelievably, he said that uh, it made the world a safer place. This was something that he he brought out when he visited uh, the U.K. back in uh, April of 2016. Clip two. You look at something like Iran, where obviously the United States and Iran has had uh, a terrible relationship since 1979. The, the theocracy there has engaged in all kinds of uh, very dangerous and provocative behaviors, um, and they were on the path to obtain a nuclear weapon. Uh, the hard diplomatic work that we did along with the UK and the EU and uh, members of the Security Council to forge an agreement where they are no longer on the path to get a nuclear weapon. Uh, we never engaged in a military strike to do it, uh, but it resulted in a much safer world. And now that the details are emerging about all that went into that, de that deal and really all that uh, the United States, in the case of this Politico piece, uh, stopped even investigating or prosecuting, it really is incredible to see what the, Ob the Obama administration did and turned a blind eye to uh, just to get a deal, anything and everything, to get the deal done. So that's really at the heart of this, uh, this expose in, uh, in Politico, this uh, reporting from, uh, from Josh uh, Meyer. He, uh, he had a piece earlier in the year, before I get to the one Richard's just gone through this morning, he had one from April uh, of this year uh, about Obama's hidden Iran deal giveaway uh, and I thought he summed it up uh, perfectly in uh, the the uh, the article from earlier in the year. He said, a few months after Obama left the White House, people are starting to realize there uh, was some strange stuff happening the last few years on Pennsylvania Avenue. The things that seemed to make sense last year, like exchanging Iranian crooks and spies for ordinary American citizens, now look ridiculous, he said. And it's clear why the deliberate urgency uh, with which the administration messaged its Iran policy had the feel of an advertising campaign, because it was an advertising campaign crafted to convince consumers that something you think is bad for you is actually good for you. And that's really what was behind the narrative that Ben Rhodes was out there selling to the media and then later bragging about the fact that it wasn't even true. But it was just anything to get the deal done, as uh, Josh Meyer wrote in that piece from April of this year. Something that Americans knew and know is bad for us. But there was the administration every step of the way saying, no, it's good. This is good. Like that clip that we just played for you. We didn't even have to engage in a military strike. And look, it's resulted in a much safer world. So Josh Meyer, earlier in the year, Obama's hidden Iran deal giveaway, and then the latest piece at uh, Politico, which, as Richard said, is 14,000 words, the secret backstory of how, of how Obama let Hezbollah off the hook. This is how uh, this most recent piece is set up. It says, in its determination to secure a nuclear deal with Iran, the Obama administration derailed an ambitious law enforcement campaign targeting drug trafficking by the Iranian-backed terrorist group Hezbollah, even as it was funneling cocaine into the United States. This is according to the, the Politico investigation. So this project, um, project called Cassandra, or Cassandra, um, is, uh, is the... The, the, the effort to try to bring down or to derail this, uh, this drug trafficking um, that the Hezbollah was engaged in. So maybe, uh, Richard, you could explain, um, just to begin with here, tell us a little bit about this, uh, this project, Cassandra. Right, well, it was set up, uh, it was an interagency project, but mainly overseen, I think, by the Drug Enforcement Agency. And... People investigating Hezbollah from a few different directions were starting to see some very remarkable patterns. So you had some people looking at just at drug smuggling within the United States, and they were starting to see, whoa, more and more of this is coming from Hezbollah. You had other people looking at 
weapons that that Shiite militia were using against American troops in Iraq. They were looking at some very advanced improvised explosive devices. They could blow the sides off a tank. And they were trying to work out, well, how are these militia, militia getting these advanced weapons? And the same name started coming up in those investigations. And so a few, the, several of these different people from these different departments then got together, pooled their resources and came up with this Project Cassandra that was designed to focus on Hezbollah and what they were doing here in Latin America, in North Africa and around the world. And they really unearthed some some startling facts about what Iran was doing. So they found that they were funneling a, a billion dollars a year from drug trafficking. From this, they were becoming deeply embedded in Latin America, drawing very close to some of these governments. They were even working on some of these, or the, these same individuals that were heavily involved in this were involved in smuggling things like chemical weapons into Syria, um, Russian weapons into Syria, were even components for American nuclear bomb plots. So this was just a vast, powerful and deadly Hezbollah cell, Hezbollah you know, network reaching all around the world that was involved in this drug, tra drug trafficking. So they found very, very quickly that they had... Uh, just a really big case on their hands. And as they watched this case, it just continued to grow. Yeah. And the the investigation, it, it says here in your notes, it was launched in 2008. So right as, as basically as the Obama administration's coming into office, you have these different government agencies that are finding or beginning to find out all of these, uh, these details regarding uh, Hezbollah's drug trafficking worldwide. Right, because this is the Project Cassandra grew out of there were earlier projects, things like Project Titan that were maybe more narrowly focused just on drug smuggling. But yeah, they were starting to get started, and this firm, Mister for the George W. Bush presidency, was a high priority. Right, uh, just from a na matter of national security, you know, they made disrupting what Hezbollah was doing in Latin America a top priority. Uh, the Hezbollah's terrorist wing, the Islamic Jihad organization. By 2008, the Bush administration believed that the, what these, this was the most dangerous terrorist organization in the world. They said that they were capable of launching instantaneous attacks, possibly with chemical, biological or low grade nuclear weapons that would dwarf those of 9-11. So they were really concerned in 2008 by some of the signs of what they were seeing, what Hezbollah was doing in Latin America, what Hezbollah was capable of in Latin America what Hezbollah was funding with the drug trafficking, yes, but also just the way that they were setting up a base in America's backyard, reaching into America through these drug operations. And then, well, how could they leverage that in the future to massive terrorist attacks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so after 2000 and, uh, 2008, then, is when it's coordinated and mm -hmm. the agencies sort of come together and say, hey, these same names keep popping up. Is Is it something where the drug trafficking was just, how Hezbollah funded its uh, its terrorist operations as well? Yeah, absolutely. It was a big yeah. part of it, sending a, a ton of money over there. Um, I mean, one of these, uh, one of the guys that was very heavily in, involved in this, uh, who's the same one that gave gave the testimony a while back, David Asher. Right. He would talk about just how you know he would say basically just look at Beirut, look at the skyline of Beirut, look at the skyscrapers that are propping up there and you're just getting this massive influx of money into into Beirut into Lebanon because of the drugs trafficking network even to the point that the amount of US dollar cash reserves in Beirut doubled in the course of a few years because there were just all of these dollars flooding into Hezbollah who was then spending them and, and that kind of thing uh, that was so that, yeah, it was making a huge difference in terms of Hezbollah's funding. And then they were using the same networks to purchase and smuggle weapons as well. Right. So they're smuggling drugs, they're smuggling weapons. It talks about uh, elsewhere in this article the way you had they had high, they had government relations with Venezuela. And you'd have a plane flying backwards and forwards from straight from Venezuela to Tehran in Iran. And one way it would be full of drugs or um, laundered money and in the other way it would be full of weapons so it kind of yeah it flowed both ways money and weapons into the middle east and drugs drugs out to america
And this uh, David Asher, which agency did he represent? Do you, do you recall? Yeah, he was the uh, the DEA, the um, the Drug Enforcement Agency, I believe he he worked with. But he kind of moved around a bit as well. But he he was one of the defense. He was also for, with the Defense Department who was, you know, oversaw the finance ring of there. So I think he's one of those experts. And America has over the years had some great experts in terms of f- following the money. Right. I remember reading reports years ago where they were following the money and finding where Iran and Al-Qaeda were working together and how Al-Qaeda was getting all these funds from Iran. And he I think he was one of those analysts working mostly with the defense. So I think I said the DEA earlier. I meant the Defense Department okay. um, analyzing those those funds. So he gave, uh, and we played some of this back in June, but he gave uh, he testified before the House Foreign Affairs uh, Committee on June 8th. And uh, he talked about some of these ongoing investigations and how that they were basically squashed by the uh, Obama administration. Sam, why don't you play clip nine? I'm proud to say that a seamless collaborative web of combining a small group of U.S. agencies was established and leveraged to combat these activities using every agency's unique authorities. It's with the sort of whole government approach that makes you proud about being a part of this government. This combination of law enforcement, uh, financial, criminal, civil, and regulatory authorities led to a wide range of actions, which you've heard about providing a framework to deter, disrupt, publicly illuminate uh, the, the, the global illicit uh, Hezbollah network. And I think it was probably the most successful operational effort taken against Hezbollah to date by the U.S. government after many years of inaction. So that's uh, from his June 8th testimony, and he was explaining, just uh, like Richard just indicated, how extensive it was and, and how successful it was. Uh, but they were prevented from uh, from actually going in and prosecuting so many of these uh, drug traffickers and so many of these uh, Hezbollah terrorists. This is uh, another clip from that same testimony, number 10. Yet in the last few years of the previous administration, um, for reasons that most definitely had to do with the Iran deal and concerns of interfering with it, which I thought were totally unfounded as a former nuclear negotiator with Iran and North Korea, um, we lost, Pull the uh, microphone a little closer. We lost much of the uh, uh, altitude that we'd gained in our global uh, effort. Um, and many aspects, including key personnel who were reassigned, uh, budgets that were slashed, many key elements of the investigations that uh, were underway were undermined. Uh, and uh, it was a bit of a tragedy and a travesty, and I, I, I think it's, uh, it was, again, very unfounded. But today we have to deal with the legacy of that and how to rebuild this capability. So it was undermined. <laughs> it was undermined because of the, uh, the Iran nuke deal. So maybe coming back to this, uh, this political piece, then, Richard, um, maybe you could cover uh, just some of the implications of, uh, of uh, what Josh Meyer is talking about in this secret backstory of how Obama let Hezbollah off the hook. Yeah, well, I think it is major implications. They had, he talked about in there how there were two different four-star generals. The ones, I think it was the Central Command and Southern Command, had all warned that Hezbollah's activities in Latin America were an urgent threat to U.S. security. So you've got just that aspect of it. You've got the fact that they... that. Has, that Hezbollah is being allowed to operate within Latin America. He talked in that piece about how, for example, members of Iran's Al-Quds force, you know, not even just Hezbollah, but the Al-Quds force, this elite branch of the Iranian military, were found to be operating in the United States. And they, they, they covered the whole, they've, they uncovered this whole network. Uh, they prosecuted some, and, but others were just let off. And they didn't really go after them. And Asher said that was despite the fact they had excellent evidence, testifying witnesses. So you're looking at terrorist activity by the United States, I mean, by Iran within the United States that's allowed to continue. And some of the most remarkable material, I think, from that Politico piece was actually towards the end of the piece itself, Mm -hmm. where it was just talking about how... Well, it had a few different quotes from different experts talking about how Hezbollah is even right now continuing to look for targets in the United States in case they want to attack America in the future. Um, they talked about how Asha told lawmakers that in West Africa, satellite imagery is docu- documented that Hezbollah's used car money laundering operation is bigger than ever. 
So in that piece, it talked about how Hezbollah has huge contacts with various different used car dealerships throughout the United States. They use that to, as a front for money laundering. These contacts within the United States have just continued to grow. Uh, they quote Man Magnus Ranstop, who is, they say, was one of the world's foremost Hezbollah experts, saying that they are, global th they are a global threat, particularly if the Trump relationship turns sour and that there were some recent arrests of Hezbollah agents planning attacks on U.S. interests. And he said that this brings sharply into focus the fact that the Iranians are making contingency plans for when the U.S. turns the heat up in Iran. So just the fact that you've got the potential for a massive attack, perhaps even using, as we quoted earlier, chemical um, or even perhaps some kind of nuclear weapon. Hezbollah are capable of that. They're being allowed. They've, they've kind of gotten off the hook there. Then you've got the drug smuggling and how they're just continuing to get all of these funds still. There was the opportunity to disrupt that. It didn't happen. And look at what Hezbollah has been doing with the money since in Lebanon and Syria. The massive victory that Iran and, and Hezbollah have achieved in Syria. Now they're presumably not going to be have to focus so many of their resources in Syria. So they're going to have all of that money to spend just within Israel. And yeah, they've already been stockpiling weapons in Israel. This article also talked about how... Hezbollah has more heavy armaments than most nation states and has over 120,000 rockets and ballistic missiles. And a lot of that is funded by that drug money. Mm -hmm. So you've just you've got that. And the fact that they're able to continue moving these things around, things like chemical weapons, uh, biological weapons. I mean, to me, one of the most egregious examples in this, because I did I do love the way that this piece you know, it's not just, say, one guy's testimony or even two, three guys' testimony. They have a lot of examples of right. people that got that got off the hook. And you know, one of these, a Lebanese arms dealer, dealer called Ali Fayed, they actually put together a successful sting operation against him. He was arrested in Czech Republic, and they just kind of assumed, well, that's it. You know, he'll be extradited over to the U.S. We've got him. We can blow this thing wide open. And instead... The Obama administration didn't really apply any pressure on the Czech Republic, while Vladimir Putin applied a lot of pressure. Right. And the week after the Iran deal, he was released. And this article says now he's believed by U.S. officials to be back in business, helping to arm militants in Syria and elsewhere with Russian heavy weapons. And so it's all these people that America had the chance to stop. Yeah. And they're still going. I think that was the point, if I remember from his uh, from Josh's uh, April um, article from earlier in the year where he, because the Obama administration made it seem like that, well, this, the swapping for American prisoners, um, the Iranians that we gave them were just kind of low level, just guilty of, of minor crimes. But <laughs> he went through all of these individuals and what they were actually engaged in, some of the things that you're talking about, about right there. So it's, it's good to see him continue on. Uh, he's evidently not letting it go. And I guess... Uh, <laughs> It's a little surprising that Politico, um, a, a pretty uh, a pretty much a leftist uh, publication, um, is uh, giving him a platform uh, to do that. So that's great. Did it did it have anything to say about uh, just the bind that it puts the Trump administration in? Because I know the mm -hmm. uh, the Trump administration, I guess, uh, what was it, a few weeks back, where it didn't, uh, or it's it's coming up to January, I believe, where they have to. This uh, the JCPOA has to be renewed or something along those lines. Well, it did talk about how actually the, there is like the, the Trump administration has been reaching out to some of the people that used to work on Project Cassandra, right? Because uh, really, that whole project after the JCPOA was signed back in January, you know, that January deal was was came into force. It was basically disbanded, and people were either pushed out or moved aside, and so. It said that Mr. Trump or his administration was trying to reach out to some of those figures, trying to kind of salvage some of that. Uh, and there have been some arrests based on some of that work just in the past year since Donald Trump's come into office. But they basically said, we we think that those arrests are going to be probably the biggest news that comes out of it because now all the intelligence is a year old, the contacts are a year old, you know, the trust and relationship that they'd built up with informants is gone because if you're informing against people that could kill you, you you want to be pretty sure those people are going to get locked up. Uh, and so they've lost that confidence. So they they think, OK, they were able to pick up some of the guys, at least they were able to salvage some of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but they don't really think 
that the that the Trump administration is going to be able to to rebuild this. And then it also talk, he talks about towards the end. Yes, there have been some efforts to kind of reach out to these people, but at the same time, there hasn't been a huge concerted effort to to resurrect it or to really go after this in a lot of detail. And he talked about how Donald Trump hasn't really said anything about Iran's deal with with Latin America. But it is like you know, now it's shut down. It trying to resurrect it again is shutting shutting the stable doors after the horses horses have bolted. Right. I mean, it, it would probably take several years. I'm guessing to get back right to the way they were before well richard thank you for digesting this four thousand fourteen thousand word article while i was in a couple of meetings this morning very helpful uh hopefully josh meyer will continue uh to look into this uh but it really does uh it really does show that uh, and i'll talk about this uh, coming up here in the next segment where where uh another article like so many we've been quoting from uh of late talks about uh, Iran's uh, spreading influence across the Middle East. And uh, the reason why that this story is so significant is because here you had the previous administration of the United States really aiding and abetting this movement and, and empowering it in so many ways. And now you see it's power. And now all these these articles are coming out saying that this is the next, I mean, this is the next big power the United States is going to have to confront in uh, in the Middle East. So I'll get into that briefly in the next segment. And then, as I said, at the start of the program, we'll conclude uh, today's um, program with uh, another segment by uh, Richard Palmer on the prophesied prince of Russia. You're listening to Stephen Flurry along with Richard Palmer. And uh, this is the Trumpet Daily Radio Show. We'll be right back. <laughs> 